opportunity that we have. And we're in the midst of this time like none of us have ever experienced. Help us experience you like we've never experienced. And Father, as we are now starting to stay, instead of uh, staging in place, help us to really realize that we have been given a golden opportunity to worship in place. And so may we use the time wisely. May we spend our time uh, getting to know you better, reading your word, maybe reading passages that we have long since forgotten that we've ever read, uh, and long since forgotten what we read when we did. And Lord, help us again to uh, be good stewards of those that live around us. Help us to take care of those who can't get out and about. And help us to be uh, sensible and uh, understandable and uh, just realize that there are certain people that feel very strongly one way about what to do and other people who feel very strongly another way about what to do. So help us not to invade their conscience and help us to just honor one another, most of all, as one another seek to honor you. Now, as we open up your word, we know that the only way that we're going to learn is if you indeed uh, break through the human words, break through the human distractions, and do what only you can do. Uh, bring us close to yourself. Reveal yourself through your word today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. If you have a Bible, I hope you have your Bible open to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8 is where we're going to be. I'm going to go ahead and read verses 22 through 25. Uh, wherever you are, I know that most of us know that we're supposed to stand up when we read. You can stand up, sit down, you can do whatever you would like to do. Here we go, Luke chapter 8, verse number 22. One day he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, Let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out. And as they sailed, he fell fast asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water, and they were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he woke, and he rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased. And there was a calm. He said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, and they said to one another, Who then is this, that he commands even the winds and the waters, and they obey him? Today what we want to talk about is uh, Jesus calms the winds and the waves, but the first question I want to ask us is, but can he calm me? Uh, you know, when I read this story, I read this story and I realize that he could do that then, but what can he do with me right now, uh, right here, right in the situation I am? Can he do anything in my life today that will calm the raging winds and the, uh, the roaring rapids of my life? Can he calm me down? Over the next few weeks, we're going to take a look at, at Luke as petition this out a little bit. And we're going to see today that Jesus is the Lord of all creation. Next week, we're going to take a look at Jesus as the Lord of all the spiritual world. Then the next week, we're going to take a look, and it says that Jesus is the Lord of all, including death itself. It's going to end up when Jesus looks at the disciples and says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter's going to give his confession of faith that you are the Christ. And he's going to say, and on that confession that you are the Christ, I will build the church, and even the gates of hell will not prevail. Coronavirus will not prevail against the church. Nothing can prevail against the church. God is in control. He is Lord of all. Now, he is doing all of this not just simply to show us that he is a powerful God or that he, he can just have control over the winds and the waves. Uh, his, his power is revealed to them and hopefully revealed to us even today. And it always shows his compassion and his willingness and his desire to intervene. That means that wherever they were, as long as they were with Jesus, they knew that they were going to be okay. Now let's think about this today. If wherever you are, if you know that Jesus is with you. You see, back then they felt that they needed the physical body of Jesus to be with them to be okay. Now we know we need the spiritual oneness of the Holy Spirit in us to know we will be okay. But just as they were completely okay then, Jesus could look at us today in the midst of our roaring rapids, and he could say to us when we get so filled with anxiety over, I can't go here, and I can't do this, and I can't, and I can't, and I can't, 
What can I do? I can relax in the arms of a loving God who can look at me and say, where is your faith? Where is your faith? And so he always has this power and the ability and the desire and the willingness to intervene in the things of life. We can also find this story in Matthew chapter 8 and in Mark chapter 4, and we're going to be um, discovering that they don't all say the exact same thing, but they all have absolute agreement. But it is interesting. Now, I'm going to try putting my cursor up. Can anybody see that I'm doing the cursor on Mark chapter 4? If you can see me moving the cursor, I'm, I can see a few of you on my screen. Uh, and, and so I'm going to be pointing at a lot of things. But it is interesting that the shortest gospel in the Bible, whenever it has the exact same account of other gospel writers like Luke and Matthew, that the shortest gospel, Mark, always gives us the most information. So I'll be going back to Mark. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but I will be showing you some excerpts from Mark as well as from Matthew as we continue to continue. Let's not forget that Luke had a purpose for doing the writing. He was writing to a person by the name of Theophilus, and he was saying, this is I'm writing you so that you can know for certain what you have been told. And so he is writing topically, and so he is not worried about trying to get everything in exact chronological order. He is just saying, this thought leads to this thought leads to this thought leads to this teaching so that we can grow in our faith. So there are some exact details. Now, of the three, who is the only one that would have been in the boat at the exact same time that this happened? Well, it have been Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We know Mark was not in the boat. We know Luke doesn't come into the scene until Acts chapter 6. So of the three writers, the only one that was really an eyewitness is Matthew. So that makes Matthew, in many people's opinion, the most accurate as far as the exact details. But there are some details that sometimes we forget to say. Now, uh, we'll point that out as we continue to go along. Now here is a chart, and here is the account in Matthew, here is the account in Mark, and over here is the account in Luke. And I want to point out just a few things as we take a look at these. If you did print off your uh, e uh, email that I sent you with the notes on it, you could actually write these in yours during the course of the week if you would like to. Uh, but notice they all say that Jesus gets into the boat, but over here in Luke it just says one day, as if it was just some indiscriminate day. But what does Mark say? The same day, although the evening of the day that he gave the sermon of the seed and the sower. So what does Mark say? It says on the same day, not just some day, but on the same day of the seed and the sower. I want you to take a look down here. In Mark it says that he uh, crossed over and that instead of just getting in one boat, there were many boats. So Jesus didn't just calm the waves for the one boat that the apostles were in, disciples at this time. He calmed the waves for all of the boats that was in there. You know what that means? That if God intervenes in a miraculous way, if we were to start praying about COVID-19 and God was to intervene and bring a calmness, he wouldn't just do it for us at Westside. He would do it for everybody who is intervening in the waters at the same time. The rain is going to fall. The goodness is going to happen for those all around and notice down here, it says that they come to Jesus. And Oh, let me go back up here again. It says that Jesus got into the boats and the disciples followed him. It says on this day that the disciples actually got into the boat and invited him in. And over here, Jesus initiates it. So if you take a look at all three of the gospel writers, two of them says that the disciples invited Jesus. One of them says Jesus invited the disciples. And so there's all of this disagreement. Somebody could easily say, see, the Bible doesn't even know what it's talking about. But remember, each one of these, Matthew is writing to a predominantly Hebrew audience. And so he stays centered on the apostles. Luke is writing to Theophilus. So he stays central on, if God could do this for disciples, he could do this for you. But Mark is writing to the Romans. And in the Romans, he is trying to say, Jesus first. You see, this one had a Jesus first mindset. This one had a Jesus first mindset. This one needed a Jesus first mindset. So he puts Jesus initiating. And, and the disciple, I mean the disciples initiating because he says you've got to initiate and respond to this call of God. Notice down here, it says the boat is filling up, great storms, and then Jesus, according to Mark, is has his head on a pillow. He is sleeping on a cushion. Now we come down and all three times they're going to wake Jesus up. But I, if you notice over here in Matthew, it says that they go to him and they say, Curios, which is the, the word for save us, Lord. 
If we come over here and we take a look at Mark, it says, save us, the Zaskalos, meaning uh, rabbi, teacher. And over here, it's apistates, which is leader in control, the duly anointed one who is over me. And so every single one used words that would fit their audience. And so does it matter whether or not these were all identical words? No, they are teaching us that Jesus is not only Lord, he is teacher, he is master. So if we take a look at all three of these events and put them together as a unified whole, instead of seeing three different events, we get a bigger picture of one event with absolute certainty and absolute agreement that Jesus is indeed Lord. Jesus is indeed teacher and Rabboni, my teacher, and Jesus is indeed master. Not just master of the universe, but he is my master of my life. He is the master of my boat, the boat in which I live. Now, I'm going to come back to this again. And let me just say as well, if you're watching this by way of either the YouTube that's running, or if you're watching it by way of the live streaming, that all of these charts I can email to you. So if you like them, all you have to do is send me an email. I will reply to that email and send the charts to you. There's more to come. If we take a look at God in the Old Testament, there are several great Old Testament passages that tell us what God is and what God does that actually not only tell us something about God, but it tells us something about Jesus. In Psalm 65, 5, it says this, Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds towards the children of men. Take a look at this in Psalms 89, 89. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you, no one with your faithfulness who is all around you that is greater or mightier than you? No one. You rule, notice, the raging seas. When the waves rise up, you will still them. Not only this is talking about possibly looking back at the Exodus, but it is looking forward to maybe this very event in Luke chapter 8. Let's take a look at Psalms 106, 8. Yet he saved them for his name's sake. Now why? Because he is showing them that he is God, he is compassionate, he is able, and he does save. For his mighty works and mighty powers he has made known. Take a look at Psalms 107, 29. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were silenced. That's the Hebrew word hush, and it's going to be very similar to the Greek word that we'll look at in just a minute in our story. He made them silence. Did you know that they also use this whenever Jesus is in a debate with his Pharisees, and we'll get there eventually as we look at the life of Jesus, he will use such incredible theology and wisdom and just, uh, just normal common sense that the Pharisees just look there and, and just the, the Bible says that they, they went stupefied. Uh, we'll find that word in Job here in a minute. In other words, it just meant that there was nothing they could say. That any response would show how ignorant they were. Jesus is indeed Lord of all creation. Now, uh, just as men pray to God in the Old Testament, so now they are crying out to the God who is with them. So when they go to him and they said over here, Lord, teacher, Master, They were looking at Jesus and crying out to Jesus. In the Old Testament, they cried out to a God they couldn't see. In this boat, they were crying out to the God they could see. So they were recognizing, even though they didn't say it, that Jesus indeed, Emmanuel, and we all know that Emmanuel means God is with us. He is in the boat with us. And so no matter how lonely you may feel, or no matter how cabin fevered you may feel over these next couple of days, and I really pray that by next week, we'll all be able to come back together again that the, this whole ban will be lifted. But until it is, you are never alone. Now, I want you to notice this. Just as men praised God back in the Old Testament that they could not see, and just as they cried out to Emmanuel that they could, we can still pray that and praise and cry out to that exact same God right now if we needed to. And we don't just go through just... The, the, the clouds of, of space, we don't just go through the, the waves of the world and in the boat that we are in, we can go through the cross. And because God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, the cross makes God, through Christ, imminently available to you too. Again, going back and just studying through the story, it says, and then one day, 
just indiscriminately. What is Luke trying to do? He is trying to say that I'm going to give you three teachings in a row that's going to build from you are the Lord of all creation to you are the Lord of all the spiritual world to you are the Lord of all. And so keeping with the connection of what he has just taught about, and what was that? Who can really be in the family of God? Who is my family? Who are my brothers? Who is my mother? And remember what he said? Those who listen and obey. Now, remember that word in the original language was all one word. It was the ability to hear with the desire to obey. So they were not just saying, yeah, I hear you. They were saying, tell me more. Help me more. Increase my ability to understand. They set sail, and it says here that Jesus falls asleep. Now, this word here for fall asleep is this word, and usually it is used as to be woken up. I don't know how many of you, but have you ever had somebody say, wake up, wake up, wake up? And just shake you away. Oh, where am I? But the word in the aorist tense means to fall asleep. Ugh, just all of a sudden fall asleep. I don't know you, but I've been in rooms with people, and uh, it's been late at night, and the fireplace has been on, and, and I have had actually people talking to me and saying words out loud, and they fell asleep while they were talking out loud. Fascinating. They just went sound asleep. Jesus is in the boat. And he falls not just asleep. It says he falls fast and he falls hard asleep. Which says to me again, when the Bible says in every way he was tempted just like us, that just says to me again that, that when we get tired and, 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 and we just need to rest, so did Jesus. And the thing is, even though Jesus knows what's about to happen, he still found the ability to go to sleep. But you know, when I don't know what's going to happen, I can't. I don't know about you, but I have spent many times where I've just laid in bed and I can't fall asleep because I can't turn it off. But if the God of all the universe, who knows what's going to happen, now you could say, but he knows he's going to fix it. And I don't know if I, I don't know, I don't need to know if I can fix it. I, can, I should be able to fall asleep knowing I am falling asleep into the hands of God. And either I'm going to wake up and he is still going to be in control, or I'm going to not wake up here, but wake up there and find that he is even more in control. But either way, God is still going to be sovereign. I tried this picture yesterday and had Margaret on video cam with me. I, I hope it turns out as well. And you can let me just look around. Some people still have their cameras on. Can you see the picture up on it? Is it pretty clear? And so this is an artist rendition of Jesus. And if you take a look, if you can see, here's Jesus up on the, here's the pillow that he's asleep in. And the thing I like about this is you can see how small the boat really is. A lot of times when people think about the fishing boats of the New Testament, they think of these big boats and they would have to, uh, you know, but no, they are very small boats. In fact, you can see that to put 13 people in that boat would have been dangerous. Just even on a calm day. But to put 13 people in that boat on that day would have been extreme. The waves would not have been very high. But it says that the Lord of all creation gets in a boat. Now, this is a boat that was actually salvaged in the uh, Magdala, uh, where Mary from Magdalene came from. And when we were in Israel, we actually got to go in. And you could see the bottom of the boat is just rib after rib after rib after rib. There is no flat bottom. So when Jesus gets in this boat, he is not sleeping on a nice flat surface. They would not have brought blankets in there because they would have just gotten wet. And so they will, he, But he does have a pillow. But his entire body is just on rib after rib after rib. Let me see if I can get another picture so you can see. Now, John here is about 6'5", so you can see that if he was to lay down, this boat's probably less than 10 feet long, maybe 10 to 12 feet long. And so could you imagine that means in this world of, uh, what do we call that? We are in New York, some kind of spacing, what kind of spacing? Social distancing. That when they got on that boat, there was no social distancing. They were jam-packed in that boat. In the background here is a mosaic. I'm going to take a picture of it again. But many times there would be a sail or a mast that would come out of the top of the boat. And so it would look something like that. That is the mosaic that is in this museum in Israel. Uh, and so now let me just go back and say this. That Jesus falls fast asleep. And it says here in the text, text that the winds came down. 
Now, in this particular body of water is surrounded by some very large mountains over on the uh, far east side would be the Golan Heights and then the mountains that goes up to Israel, to Jerusalem and Samaria on the other side. And so as the winds come down, they would funnel down into it. And that's why it says, and the storm came down. We're not just talking about rain coming down from the sky. We're talking about wind sweeping over the mountains, coming up over the mountains and shooting down into the valley and just turning it up. Did you know that the Sea of Galilee, the Lake of Gennesaret, uh, the Sea of Tiberias, whichever name you want to give it, it is not unusual during these time periods for the waves to go over 20 feet high. Now let me just ask, in a little boat that's probably only got four to six inches above the water line, once everybody gets in there, could you imagine what a 20 foot wave would do to that boat? Let's see if we can put that back up there again. Now I want you to notice, if you can see this picture at all, we have Jesus up here in the front. We've got one, two, three. We've got four, five, six, seven, eight. The artist obviously forgot that there was 13 people in the boat. But even with just eight people in the boat, you could see how crowded it would be and the mast is coming undone. Verse 24, and they went and woke him. Now, let me just say this phrase, and they went and woke him, can be a little bit misleading. Uh, uh, they went almost makes it sound like they had to go find him. Where was he? He's somewhere in the boat here somewhere. Or if you can remember, a lot of people dovetailed this back to the life of Jonah. And they went into the belly of the boat and found Jonah in the belly of the boat sleeping. They went just means they went from the back side of the boat to the front side of the boat. I mean, it would have been one wave would have gotten them there. They didn't even have to walk. They could have just waved up, if you will. And it says, and they went and they woke him. And when they did, one wave could have shot you from the back part of the boat to the front part of the boat. One wave could have sent them all the way up there. And, and notice the double. And when they get there, they look at him and they say, Master, Master. I don't know about you, but whenever you hear that double, double, uh, I usually think it just intensifies the urgency of the hour. They could have said, Jesus, or Jesus, Jesus! I haven't heard the original autograph or the original audio of this event, but I'm pretty sure it was pretty frightened and, and frantic. And, and I want you to notice that they cry out in, in, in Mark's version. It says, don't you care that we are about to perish? And, and so if you take a look here, they just wake him. But if we study all three of the accounts in Mark's account, it says that they wake him and they look at him and the first thing they say is, don't you care? And you know, that just reminds me of me so much. I don't know about you, but Mark is in the process of trying to move and Margaret is at home wishing she could be with her students and some of us are wherever we may be. And, and maybe you haven't had that thought, but I think many people have thought, yeah, what's going on? Don't you, don't, do you know what's going on? Do you even care? Do you even care uh, what's going on? Uh, some people are missing an opportunity to be at work and their income has diminished. Don't you care, Lord? Some people are stuck in, how, in the house. And they, uh, I've been uh, talking with people in Chicago in the high uh, areas where there's multifamily dwellings where there might be four or 500 units within one building where you have to take a central elevator. The children are not even allowed to leave the apartment. I could easily say to my friends in Chicago where their children are stuck in a maybe an a 800 square foot apartment, can't even go out at all, not even to the elevator. Don't you care? Don't you care that we are COVIDing 19s? We should not have to wonder or worry. Uh, and, and let's not forget, going back to the story, this, these are seasoned fishermen. Most of these seasoned fishermen are seasoned on this very same body of water. This should not have taken them by surprise. Uh, they should have, they probably had experienced this exact same kind of calamity, this exact same kind of event, many times. But all of a sudden now, their hearts are gone. Here they are, and let's not forget, we're just getting the account for one boat. According to Mark, there were several boats in this event. What do you think they were saying? They may have said something like this. We don't even know how much we even believe. They were not even in Jesus' boat. He might say, Peter, but what's he going to do for me? And yet, how many times do we in our world say, I know Jesus did this for Peter in the Bible. I know he did this for Paul in the Bible. I know he did this for Job in the Bible. 
But what is God going to do for me? Let me just say that if we are in the ways, God, and God has called us into that area of life, and Him being sovereign, He has called us all to live through this, love through this, worship Him through this. And if you've been watching your emails, you know I've changed the name of this from shelter in place to WIP, worship in place. We have been given time to get to read our Bibles that we never had. How many times have people said, I just wish I had more time to get to know God better. Well, you got it. As it says, use your time wisely. And it says that he woke up. He woke up and was just as alert as, as fast as he went to sleep, fast he wakes up. And it says that he calms the water. He, he calms to the water. He rebukes it. Now, I want you to know that this word here for rebuke does not mean cast a curse upon it. It means to evaluate. He woke up. He evaluated what was going on. Although he knew what was coming, even in his humanity in that time and space chronology, he had not lived it yet. He had lived it in, in theos. He is living it now in human. And he evaluates. He takes charge of the situation. And so many times when we hear this word rebuke, we think that we are telling somebody, you better do this and you better do that. Rebuke in the Bible, this word means to look around, evaluate the circumstance, calm down, and take charge. What do your kids need right now in the midst of COVID-19? They need for you to evaluate theologically, spiritually what's going on. For you to calm down and realize that if God is with me, who can be against me? That the gates of hell, even COVID, will not prevail against the church. And then take charge. What can you do? Instead of saying, we can't do this, what can, what can we do? You can all of a sudden have a system. You can have a schedule. You can teach Bible stories. You could go online. There's a billion puppet shows out there, great shows that you could watch with your kids. You could calm down, evaluate, take charge. He didn't just curse. This was not some... some uh, uh, biological exorcism. He, he didn't just say, cursed you win, cursed you. He says, I'm in control here. And I'm going to show all of these people in the water with me right now. And then by way of the word of God, everybody who reads this story, that I am God. And if you are with me, what does he say? It says here in, in Mark's version, it says that he looks at the winds and he looks at the waves and he says to the waves, Peace, be still. Peace, be still. That should be Mark 439 instead of Luke right there. Good thing I can catch my own typos. I think this is talking about the rebuke. And peace says this. Peace is the word siopa. Uh, and it means to be silenced. It means to be uh, just so caught with such extreme intelligence that you just realize, I have nothing to say. In Job chapter 8, verse number 3, it says, we are counted as cattle. Now, the word here for cattle is not just some cows on a thousand hills, but the cattle that is going to be used uh, to develop the sacrificial cattle of the future. And so these are the cattle for producing sacrificial cattle. We are counted as what? As important offerings. We are counted as... Uh, why are we counted as important? Because God so loved you. Well, then why are we so stupid in your sight? Because we're not God. That even the best of the best sacrifices is nothing compared to the best of the best of God and God's best sacrifice. Although we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ, we are counted as part of the cattle. We are part of the bride of Christ. But compared to the bride of God, God's only son, the bridegroom, we should stand stupid. What does that mean? Unclean instead of spotless. We realize that in the midst of this, only Jesus faced all the temptations just like me and yet without sin. And it says that in that particular time, the only thing for an unclean person like me to do in front of a perfectly clean sacrificial lamb like him is to do what? Be still, be silent, and know that he is God. And then when that happens, and then it says the peace of God will protect you and guard your minds. It will actually shut us down and then open us up. Many times we are so busy trying to tell God something, trying to have a dialogue with God, that God can't get another word in edgewise. You know how you've ever been talking to somebody and, and, and you're just waiting for them to take a breath so you can say something? 
God will not just butt in. But God is constantly knocking at the doors of our hearts. And if we will open up, he will come in and have supper with us. But then comes this spooky stillness. And he says that he said to them, be still. And it says that it was completely calm. It went from raging to completely calm. I don't know if this has ever happened to these seasoned fishermen before. I don't think it did. Because according to the text in all three of the accounts, it said immediately, immediately, they were terrified and at the same time marveled. In all three accounts, there's absolute agreement. By now, they should have had trust. By now, they should have known who he was. By now, they should have known that if they were with him, he would take care of them. And in all three accounts, now in only one of the accounts that he looks at them, in Mark's account, and says, you... You don't have any faith? By now you don't have any faith? It, neither in Matthew nor in Luke does he look at them and, and re, he rebukes the wind in all three and in Mark he rebukes the disciples. And sometimes we need that gentle reminder. We need to hear him say to you, come on now, by now you should have more faith than that. If I am with him, and he is saying to the disciples in this account, by now you ought to have better faith. Where is your faith? Did you know that even the apostles didn't have immediate perfect faith from day one? That, that faith like Christ's likeness, it needs to grow. Just like when you plant something in the soil and you watch it grow, but it is nourished. God nourishes us. God waters us. God feeds us. And after being with, the, with Jesus for this period of time, and a lot of people believe at this particular time, he is at least a year and a half, maybe two years into his ministry. So they have been with him uh, at least a year. So they've got a year of seminary under their belt. And we get all the way down to Luke chapter 17. In Luke chapter 17, Jesus is doing a great deal of teaching. He's going to teach about temptation. He's going to teach about spiritual accountability. He's going to teach about forgiveness from God and then how to give that forgiveness to others. And even if your brother sins against you multitude of times, what should we do? And at that, when the apostles hear all of this teaching, another six months into their seminary degree, they look at them and say, Lord, increase our faith. And so what should we be saying as, uh, as we continue to grow in Christ and grow in Christ's likeness and, and, and grow in understanding of who he is? We should never get to the point where we say, my faith is satisfied. We should always be willing to say and needing to be willing to say that I have not experienced everything yet. But increase my faith so that when I experience the unexpected, that the expected God is what I experience. Let's go back to the boat. It says that they looked at him and they were afraid. Now this word here for afraid is this word, and you see phobia at the beginning, and the phobia thin that case literally means that they were terrified, shaking. Uh, uh, I've got a dog. He's a pit bull. He's the biggest baby in the world. And if he hears a sound that is completely foreign to him, he will just sit in the corner and shake. Uh, and uh, the little uh, chihuahua is looking at him like, come on, dude. It was just the refrigerator door. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes we take a look and, and we think that this person by now ought to have the spirit. And, and don't be surprised if the people that you think have the greatest amount of ability to handle it are the very people that don't have this, uh, the ability to handle it. We all of a sudden will have certain things affect us differently. But it says that they all had this word. They were all completely terrorized by what happened. What does that mean? These seasoned fishermen saw what happened, and they were terrified at what happened. But it also says that they marveled. Now, this word here for marvel literally means to be blown away with uh, anticipation. That I'm afraid, but it's so good. I'm afraid, but it's so good. And how many times have we, in our spiritual lives, have we seen God, read God's word, experience something, and at the one time it says, ooh, and at the other time it goes, ooh, and, and we are just doing this bipolarness, and on one side we are just scared to death, and the other side we are just as, as, as uh, uh, positive as we can be, and we're scared to death, and we're optimistic, and we're positive, and we're optimistic, and we're negative, and, and back and forth, and then notice that they don't say to Jesus. You would think that they would have walked to the front of the boat, and they would say, Jesus, who are you? 
but they look at each other and they say to one another, this is one of the one another's that are not necessarily one of the good ones. And they said to one another, who then is this? Now, the only person who really knows the answer to that is Jesus, and the only person they don't ask is Jesus. Just be careful that as we live through this station in life that we are living, that you don't spend so much time watching the television, hearing from people who don't know what is and what isn't. Uh, the first thing that they would say is, uh, this is this and that is that, and do this and then don't do that. Um, spend more time with the one who can give you the answer. Uh, you may not find the answer or the cure to COVID-19, but you will find how to live victoriously and prosperously and strong with confidence in the midst of uncertain times in your life. You're not going to find that on the news channels. You're not going to find that on streaming people that are not God. Go to God's word. Go to God himself. And they said to one another, who then is this? Now it is interesting, this question is not answered, but it is implied. When the God of the Old Testament did things, uh, everybody seemed to give God the glory for that, recognize that there was it. Jesus now does what only the God of the Old Testament could do. He could still, what did he say in the Old Testament? That God himself will still the wind and still the raging sea. And so when he said, peace be still, he could easily have been saying this, peace be still, and then to the disciples in the boat, he could have said, and know that I am God. You're not just in the boat with this human Jesus. This human Jesus is Emmanuel. And when we open up our scriptures, and remember, we've got something they didn't have. They lived the event with Jesus in the boat. We can relive it every day with a full translation of the Bible that's very accurate, and very re reliable, completely sovereign under the grace of God through the different councils. I want to close by reading a couple of passages out of Psalms. You might not be able to see it very well on the screen, but it reads like this, Psalms 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help, present help, not far off. He is right here with us. And if we're asking where is God in the midst of this uh, a worship in place situation that we're in, God is right here in your room. In fact, if you've asked him and you've been elected, he's in your heart. He's even closer than that. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar up and foam, though the mountains tremble and it's swelling, Selah, I'm going to drop down to verse number four. There is a river whose streams make glad the cities of God, the holy inhabitants of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. The church will not be moved. God will help her. When morning dawns, the nations rage, the kingdoms totter, but his voice he utters, and the earth will melt. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolation on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. All these things will pass away. Be still and know that I am God. What did Jesus say to the winds? What did Jesus say to the waters? Be still. We can hear even more than that. Be still and know that I am God. And then he goes on to say this. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And the last verse says this. The Lord of hosts is with us. The last verse of, of chapter 46. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob, he and he alone is my fortress. God has made some promises in the Bible. The problem is not, has God made enough promises? The problem in time like this is, do I know them? And probably even greater than that, do I trust him in those promises? And I say unto you that thou, Peter, and upon this rock, on this confession of faith, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. 
There is nothing that's happening in the world today and nothing that will happen in the world into the future that will destroy the church. And let's not forget, I am in a building, but this is not the church. We are now the church video. Some people will be later in the church YouTube. It does not replace the fellowship. When the disciples first got together in Acts chapter 2, they said there were four things that we need to do to create fellowship. One, preach the word. Two, break bread. Three, fellowship with God, with one another. And four, have corporate prayer. Now, we can't do all of those right now, but we're going to do as many as we can. We're going to teach God's word. It is okay for you to be eating donuts while we're doing this. It is okay for, for you, and I noticed that a couple of people have actually chimed in on the chat box and said, good morning, everyone. That's okay for you to do that. Uh, the one thing that we can do, we can still pray together. We are not together, but we are not alone. We may not be in the same room, but we have the same Holy Spirit inside of each and every one of us. So what should I do? When God says, now, I know you may have a hard time reading all of this, but when you say, I can't figure it out, God says, don't worry, I've got to figure it out. And then there's a verse. When you say, I'm too tired, he says, I will give you rest. And it says, take my yoke upon you and I will give you rest. When you say it's impossible, he says, all things are possible. And if you would like this complete chart, I would be more than happy to email this to you at all, as, as well. But down here on the bottom, these last two I want to make mention of. It says, when I am afraid, it says, fear not, for I am with you. Second Timothy. And it says, when I feel alone, it says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, from Hebrews chapter 13. You are never alone. You are never forsaken. We may not be the church in one place at one time, but we will never stop being the church. A couple of more verses in closing in Isaiah 41 again. Do not fear, for I am with you. Wherever you are, I am with you. Do not be dismayed. For I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will lift you up with my righteous, mighty right hand, wherever you may be. So in other words, peace be still. In other words, calm down. In other words, relax. Relax in the arms of a loving God who knows where you are and what you are going through. Stay in the boat. He will calm your life. And so what should we do? It says in Psalm 63, 4, I will praise you. What should we be doing right now? I will praise you. What does that mean? Giving you all of the, the, any of the value that I hold for anything, I give you all of that value. You and you alone are worthy of all the value I have and all the value I could give. I can't make you more valuable, but I can sure acknowledge your value to me. I will value you as long as I live. And in your name, I'm going to walk through this COVID. I'm going to live through this COVID. I'm going to experience peace through this COVID. And when I can't get together with all of my friends and the joy of that fellowship, I can still have the joy of the Lord. I will praise you as long as I live, or shall I say this, as long as I live through whatever it is that we are going through right now. What I'm going to invite you to do is, before we sign off today, is if we could just go ahead and bow and close it. Father, I do want to thank you so very much for this lesson being on a day like today, Lord, you know that when we first undertook the project of looking through the, the story of Jesus through predominantly the life of Luke and uh, his teachings to Theophilus, that you knew before the foundation of the world that we would be doing an in and out of boat experience in the middle of our worship in place order. Lord, as we worship in place, help us to hear again today, help us to know again, not just feel, but know again today that if I am in Christ, I am okay. As long as you are sovereign, I am okay. I, I may experience some batters and some waves, but I'm still going to be okay. And if, if tomorrow, if I don't wake up on planet Earth, I'll be even better. For me to live is Christ, and as Paul says, and to die would be great. So Lord, help us live responsibly, Help us be good stewards. Help us to help those who can't help themselves in a time like this. And in everything, help us to lift up our hands and praise only you because it's in your name and your name alone. It is in your power 
and your power alone. It is for your glory and your glory alone that we shall live for you in such a time as this. And as we do, we anticipate the, the Sunday when we can all of a sudden come back together and hear the great testimonies of how we have worshipped in place during this time. But until then, may the peace of God, may the power of God, may the presence of God be manifest in us every day. I'm going to look out and say, have a great day today and don't forget to shalom.